This is the Infrastructure Matters Podcast, brought to you by the Futurum Group. We explore the latest developments in hybrid cloud computing and the technology that underpins it. In each episode, we'll dive deep into the latest trends and technologies that are shaping the hybrid cloud computing landscape. The Infrastructure Matters podcast is for information and entertainment purposes only. Please do not take anything reflected in this show as investment advice. Now your co-hosts, Stephen Dickens, Kimberly Bates, and Krista McComer of the Futurum Group. Hello and welcome to another episode of Infrastructure Matters. I'm one of your hosts here today, Stephen Dickens. I'm joined this week by Krista Mancumber. Hey, Krista, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Stephen. We're getting into a groove of doing these now. It's either Camberley and you or me and you and Camberley or we've, we're getting into a groove with these. We definitely are. And I know uh, some weeks we get all three of us, which is which is always great. But um, Camberley is she's on a wonderful trip right now, I believe, over to Portugal. Um, so hopefully she's taking a nice little disconnect from email and all that stuff, recharge batteries and take in what sounds like it'll be a wonderful trip. I know. I'm glad she's not sending us photographs and and sort of lording it over us because I am very jealous. Let's put it that way. Me too. (laughs) So we've got to keep the show rolling here. Um, Some interesting week for news. I'm off on a few weeks worth of travel, so uh, it's been good to sort of track the news from home. What's been top of mind for you this week, Krista, as we sort of dive in here? Yeah, yeah, Stephen. Um, so there was a couple of announcements um, that I kind of participated in writing some research notes on this week. I think from my perspective, probably the headlining news um, came out of Veeam this week. Mm-hmm. So Veeam acquired, um, they acquired this platform called Cirrus, like the cloud, and um, the company that developed it called CT4. And the relevance here is that it is um, going to give Veeam its own first party offering for backup as a service, Mm -hmm. Um, which so, excuse me, this is a market that Veeam has played in through working with its cloud service provider partners and through having some offerings in cloud marketplace like AWS and Azure. And um, they've actually, um, you know, they've gotten some great traction. Um, Let me think about also using this backup as a service capability to protect um, SaaS applications. Microsoft 365 being one example, Veeam has been very proud of its traction, was an early mover in the space. Um, So this is essentially going to give Veeam kind of that third option for customers to be able to buy back as a service directly from Veeam. So it's gonna be really exciting to see this, um, the team from the company CT4 that developed the platform is going to be reporting directly into Danny Allen, who is the CTO. We had the wonderful opportunity to be pre-briefed by him. It's always a great conversation with him. So really just kind of charged up to see what comes out of uh, out of this team moving forward. So is the right to think about this, is it similar to sort of what Commvault's doing with Metallic? Is is that the kind of, I mean, I mean obviously these guys will be driving their own differentiation, but is that a, a simple way to think about it? It's, yeah, so it's definitely um, along the similar vein. I would say they will be, you know, kind of competing against each other. Um, mm-hmm. So it's interesting, excuse me, Stephen, about this Cirrus platform is, Essentially, what it does is it actually front ends um, Veeam's technology. So actually, Cirrus was developed um, on top of Veeam's existing um, backup offering for Microsoft 365. And what it does is it provides a completely cloud-native um, microservices-based kind of front end for, again, that Veeam kind of data mover and kind of backup um and recovery technology so Mm -hmm. yeah they will compete against each other um and that would is what from my perspective what is kind of really interesting about the platform yeah i think i mean this place is certainly hot hotting up for sure i think you know the metallic platform's really gone gangbusters for convolt so i'm kind of not surprised here but 
you know, the, it's it's interesting the piece that you mentioned around moving from some of the marketplaces through to offering their own sort of first party solution. Is that kind of how you you see the market evolving more generally? Yeah, I think in general, I, I do think it will. I think there's so taking a little bit of a step back. So I think, um, you know, the marketplace that certainly, um, you know, is a great option for customers that want to just sort of maybe kind of slide their credit cards, so to speak, and have maybe kind of this more, mm -hmm. um, you know, high touch model on the part of the customer where maybe they have to worry about kind of managing their infrastructure, whether that be cloud infrastructure or on premises. Um, so that with the Cirrus um, solution, it's going to allow Veeam to directly kind of manage that infrastructure um, from a storage perspective for the customer. Um, so it's kind of a great model for that. And what I would add as well is that um, Veeam is still very much remaining committed to its cloud service provider partners. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, Danny Allen made sure to highlight that to us um, in our conversation with him. I know it was a part of the announcement as well. Um, and that's really because these partners can go ahead and add other kind of managed services capabilities and functionalities on top of what will be, um, you know, kind of the Cirrus by Veeam offering. So um, it's really kind of the best of, of all worlds from my perspective for customers. Um, and it really does reflect where we're seeing, um, you know, I would say data protection, but really, you know, I know we're, we're the, the Infrastructure Matters podcast, but really where we're seeing infrastructure heading in general, which is, again, having that flexibility so that customers can, um, excuse me, not only consume it as they want, but also really look to their technology providers um, for whatever level of support they're looking for, whether it be that upfront deployment, ongoing you know, maintenance and management and things of that nature. I think the optionality is the key takeaway here for me. Sometimes you're going to want that to be in an AWS marketplace. Sometimes you're going to want it on GCP. Other times you're going to want to consume it as a first party service because maybe you're working in a different geography and there's not a presence for one of those vendors. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think what we're seeing, and this is probably why we record this podcast every week is customers are looking for options. They're looking for flexibility. The infrastructure increasingly matters on how they provide it and how they're particularly from a, a ransomware perspective backed up and got the data secure. So I think one size fits all kind of isn't working for anybody as I see just more generally as a broad trend. And I think that just speaks to that sort of overall point. Absolutely. And especially, I mean, you kind of brought up the, the ransomware equation. And I think especially when we think about data backup, data recovery, um, we it's very critical to make that as seamless as we can and make sure those backups are there to make sure that recovery is possible in the event that we're hit. So what I think you know, is particularly relevant when we think about backup as a service is that oftentimes it is to protect some of these SaaS applications because, um, you know, users are wanting to consume that functionality as they are consuming their application. So mm -hmm. they're looking at it as, okay, if I'm subscribing to Microsoft 365 in the cloud, and then I can kind of add on, you know, this cloud-based service for protection and not have to worry about it too much, um, then that's just kind of a win all around. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Any other news from you this week that stood out? Yeah, yeah. So one other thing also looking at, you know, really, I guess, ransomware um, resiliency. Um, so Dave Raffo on our team and I, we had the opportunity to um, be briefed by Nutanix. Um, mm -hmm. They had an announcement this week regarding um, the ability to um, identify ransomware um, through kind of anomaly detection. Um, so that was really interesting. They also kind of, um, alongside of that announcement, um, they added in a functionality for kind of this, they call it one-click recovery. Um, so the ability to recover more quickly from ransomware. Um, and also some visibility um, and visualization around um, permissions specifically mm -hmm. and access control and things of that nature. So we do have a research note coming out um, once it's published. We'll make sure to include that here in the show notes. Um, like we'll include the one from Beam. Um, but 
from my standpoint where I see kind of Nutanix fitting in here. So when we think about um, identifying ransomware attacks and using anomaly detection, this has been an area that's been kind of very muddy um, because we have all the way from kind of endpoint detection tools all the way through, um, you know, really kind of data protection vendors talking about the ability to identify attacks. So it's important to understand kind of where within that flow, you know, certain tools are sitting. And for Nutanix, um, their ransomware identification is going to occur essentially once it has hit the production storage environment. So the benefit is that um, ideally these threats are contained before they go ahead and impact the backup environment. Um, so that means that the threat can be identified more quickly, it can be contained more quickly. Um, and then ideally, hopefully the customer is losing less data at the end of the day, and they're able to kind of minimize um, the business downtime resulting from the attack. So yes. definitely you, an interesting conversation. Yeah, for sure. Are you seeing AI? I mean, anomaly detection, am I kind of direction? I can see that being super powered by AI. Is, is that the right way to think about it? I think it's a great opportunity there, Stephen. I think to date, I think a lot of these tools would be a little bit more leaning towards kind of machine learning, mm -hmm. but I do think there's an opportunity to continue to kind of enhance those with some generative AI that is um, learning, you know, from the customer's particular environment. I know actually, I think it was last week, we may have spoken a little bit about um, a company called Alcyon that, mm -hmm. um, has kind of an AI supported kind of ransomware engine um, in that I think really does stand to not only kind of learn more proactively from the environment, um, but if there's a way without, of course, um, you know, violating any da data privacy laws, maybe for some of these models to learn from various customer environments to understand kind of have a broader vantage point into kind of the threat landscape. I think to to use your terminology, potentially super powering, supercharging in that manner, um, I think could be a great use case for AI. Yeah, if you're learning across a bigger environment than just your own and then being able to apply that learning to your environment so that you can spot, you know, you've maybe seen some patterns emerge in other environments and you can bring that that's going to be super helpful, I think. 100%. 100%. Well, keeping the thread of security, we, we co-authored a note on some announcements that Telesign. Um, yes. I mean, I think for me, we all use email. We all get email from vendors and brands and various places. It was insightful for me to dig in, and we got briefed by the team and, and then subsequently wrote a a research note on that that we'll put a link in the show notes to as we get these emails maybe you've ordered something online and you need to do a confirmation or you want the shipping information or confirmation that you've um or you're in the process of authenticating yourself and it's click on this link i think for me we all do that in our daily lives but it was really fascinating for me to dig in deep and understand how Telesign with its messaging platform and some of the capabilities they've launched is just trying to remove some of that friction. You know, if you're sending out thousands of emails and thousands of confirmation and thousands of security sort of one-time password type requests, removing those tiny bits of friction for the end user, who's maybe not tech savvy at all, but then ensuring security on the back end for the brand is absolutely vital. So I thought that was fascinating for me. You're more of a security expert than me, but it, it was great to dig in and, and collaborate on that research note. Yeah, 100%, and to have the opportunity to, to talk with the team at Telesign. And I think it's, um, you know, maybe the parallel that I might draw, right, between kind of that market and some of what we've been talking about is the complexity, right, and the fragmentation. I know, Stephen, you were alluding to it, all of these different channels that we all engage with on a daily basis, just as part of our online presence. So how do you make sure that those engagements are happening in a secure way? Mm -hmm. But then, as you're mentioning, Stephen, not um, kind of slow down the user, or add any friction. Um, it's not necessarily something I had given a lot of thought to until we spoke with them, but definitely, as you mentioned, eye-opening just regarding kind of that that problem that they're addressing. And I think it's um, going to be interesting to continue to engage with them and um, 
you know, see how that market continues to evolve as well. Yeah, I mean, you touched on it for me. It's the omni-channel piece. You're on the website. It sends you a code to your phone to authenticate. Then you get in the email back to confirm your order. Do you want to click here to, you know, there's a follow-up survey. There's a password reset. You know, yeah. multi-channel. You might be using, they might want to multi, multi-channel multi authenticate you. They might want to send you something via a text. They might want to send you something to an email. How you curate all of that from a security perspective? And it, as I say, it's seamless and easy, doesn't look weird for you. you. You kind of, as the end user, you know what's coming. You can trust the source that you're not kind of clicking on nefarious websites or sort of backlinks. I mean, we all kind of take it for granted, I think, but it's absolutely vital. I mean, the market, the number of phishing attacks, the the sort of multi-factor authentication we have to do on a daily basis, knowing that you can go to a one-stop shop is vital. A hundred percent. Yeah, it's um, probably still the most prominent way that hackers are getting in, right, mm -hmm. is kind of the social engineering and phishing. And I think as consumers and users we've probably all felt frustration at some point in time whether it be you know um not having that um that access be granted in a channel that is easy and kind of streamlined for us or if it's just you know very cumbersome so i think for telesign kind of tackling that challenge um you know i think could be could be very important and making that seamless for the vendor at the back end of the brand yeah you know yep. yes you can achieve all these outcomes but if you've got to do that with five or six different systems on the back end, you know, that that's that's kind of hard to pull off and the overhead goes up from an administrator. And also then you've got sort of handoff concerns between the various tools. So having that one stop shop was what I took away from that briefing. A hundred percent. Absolutely. So those are our news for the week. We've probably missed a hundred announcements <laughs> from the vendors. We're in crazy uh, schedule, sort of fall event season but the one project we've been working on for our deep dive we've been working with one of the big backup vendors talking to them and, and putting some research into market and we're a bit early to talk about that but we've been doing some playbacks of some of the early findings so we're not going to tell you who the vendor is yet we're going to tease you with that but chris i thought you did a great job on the playback to the vendor and I came away super excited by some of the data points and, you know, that research will come out in a few weeks time and we'll maybe talk about it again on the show. But I thought there were some things that were worthwhile sharing with the, the listeners just even early before we can talk about it more formally. Do you want to maybe just give us some of the sort of high level themes of what we did and then we can bounce around? Sure, sure. So, you know, Stephen, to your point, not necessarily giving away specifics um, yet in terms of, you know, specific data points and things of that nature. But the the summary of the study is that we looked at, um, we wanted to look at, you know, senior kind of executive level individuals um, sitting either within security or within IT operations, um, really trying to look at that C-suite where, where possible, you know, of course, not 100% of the respondents are, but they all were, you know, certainly fairly high level there. Mm -hmm. um, and really just to start to get some feedback regarding um, some of their pain points, looking at data protection. Also, however, looking at how IT operations and security are collaborating together. And I think from my perspective, Stephen, that latter point is probably one of the key findings that we came out of from the study. So I would say kind of some of the headlines are that um, the, the C level we found is um, they are recognizing this problem that data is sprawling across multi-hybrid cloud environments and that that is creating a um, direct kind of risk and kind of vulnerability when we think about um, resiliency against cyber attacks. So what we're seeing is that these two teams are beginning to collaborate. They have been over the last year, begun to collaborate more, um, more proactively to sort of address that pain point, right? So that would be kind of one of the major headlines there. Um, and it's I know we asked- you, It's interesting you mentioned that. I mean, and sorry to cut in, we talk about DevSecOps, and that's the kind of DevSecOps 
box is the phrase that gets thrown out there. But in some of these huge enterprises, they're still silo teams. Maybe the tool vendors are talking about DevSecOps, but it, the fascinating piece for me, and I thought you phrased the questions really well in the survey to kind of tease the data out, was kind of the collaboration at the operational level between those teams. Yep. Yeah, and I think what we found was, you know, essentially where these teams are at is they're kind of getting the the high level vision and goals are in place, right? So it's okay, we're all on the same team here and we're all working towards um, the same vision and the same desired outcomes. Um, when we filter that down into kind of looking at, okay, how are systems being integrated? Mm -hmm. How are they working together on, you know, areas like, um, you know, tabletop exercises or incident response? Uh, still some work remains there. You know, of course, it's it's not all, you know, completely streamlined and perfectly yet. Um, but I think the fact that these two teams are talking to each other, those kind of shared high level objectives are in place. And all of this is being recognized at the C-suite level. I think that's kind of what our team kept coming coming back to is that mm -hmm. this feedback is coming from the top down. Um, and that's really what's notable and very relevant here. The other thing that came through for the research for me was just the sheer fragmentation, the number of clouds, the number of SaaS applications. We spent a bunch of time with the vendor talking about the proliferation of SaaS yeah. vendors. From a backup and security perspective, it's just everywhere. Data is scattered. There's various SaaS applications, some of them mission critical, like a ServiceNow or a, a Salesforce or an SAP, right down to some, you know, might be a small group of two or three people in one line of business using a really sort of cheap and cheerful tool just to improve their workflow. You know, you've got everything and just hundreds of SaaS applications all with data embedded in them somewhere that it's it's a huge challenge and i think that came through as we pulled on the thread in some of the research that came through for me and i think that's going to be fascinating as we can break cover on the research for sure absolutely i mean you think about okay how much how how often is it that you know maybe line of business, they're just kind of going and swiping their credit card because, you know, oh, we need to use this particular SaaS application to support our website or something like that. And that might even be happening completely outside of the realm of control of, you know, these SecOps teams, right? Not just IT operations, not just security, but, you know, I know you kind of mentioned the DevSecOps, they are a similar idea, of course. Um, so how do we kind of wrangle control of that? How do we know, okay, what actually does even need to be protected at the end of the day? Um, and all of this is happening against a backdrop of the fact that when we think about data protection solutions, this has already been very fragmented. Mm -hmm. um, customers already have, you know, three or four, um, especially when we think about these large enterprises that have been in existence for some time now, they probably already have, you know, three, four, maybe even more data protection solutions that they're using. And now they're looking at, okay, not only do we have some of these IaaS resources like, you know, EC2, for example, but now we have all of these SaaS applications that are running our business and we need to figure out what needs to be protected there and how to protect it and how to fold that into what we're already doing. It's, it's a big headache. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that we'll talk about it when obviously the research breaks, but in a bit more detail. But I think those were that that sort of fragmentation, multiple clouds, data on prem in multiple public clouds in managed service providers, and then you layer on the SaaS applications to bring to that infrastructure complexity. It's a huge landscape to back up and ensure. And, I mean, you talked about the shadow IT swipe the credit card. You know for sure that that line of business is going to come back to the central IT function and go, I've lost my data. Can you yep. give me a backup? And the central IT function is going to go, what data? Right. You, want, you need to do what with the backup? <laughs> and, you know, you can just imagine how that conversation is going to go. Yeah, yeah. It's – um. Data protection, unfortunately, it does tend to be the afterthought. Um, and that it's always been a problem. Yeah. But I think especially today, based on, like we've been talking about this year, fragmentation, 
of these applications and also just how fast everything is moving. Mm -hmm. When we really think about it, how fast businesses are moving, how fast this proliferation is happening. It's um, and more then you difficult. Bring in AI and new yeah. applications, huge volumes of data. Is that in the public cloud? Where's the data coming from? What are we doing from a cyber resiliency point of view? You know, we've got this new AI powered chatbot attached to our sort of web or mobile interface. Where's that backed up? Mm -hmm. You know, we've got customer interactions going on in that AI sort of chatbot who's backing up those customer conversations. You know, the, 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 the level of complexity just keeps growing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it does not show signs of slowing down or stopping. <laughs> by any it certainly means. doesn't. Well, that's a great way to wrap up. I mean, this is why we record this podcast every week. So much to talk about. Krista, always a pleasure to host the show with you. Thank you, Stephen, so much. You as well. So you've been watching another episode of Infrastructure Matters. We'll see you next time. Please click and subscribe. Thanks so much for listening.